Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Late Night Hockey. My name is Steven Zahoyas, and tonight I'm joined by a very special guest. If you play fantasy hockey, you've definitely read some of Evan's work. I'm joined by Evan Borofsky of Rotowire. Evan, thank you so much for taking the time to join the show today. Pleasure to be here. And let's get right into it about you. And I want to talk about your involvement with fantasy sports. How did you get into fantasy sports, fantasy hockey in particular, and what's kept you around all these years in the fantasy industry? Well, I mean, really, I was always interested in hockey. I always collected the cards, stuff like that. And with friends, even when I was younger, I remember we used to do like, it's not really, I mean, it predates popular fantasy, but we would just like on a piece of paper draft players for the upcoming season. We were like 10 years old and we were just you know, four of us in it, just writing it down on pen and paper. That was back in the de- days right after the chisel and hammer, um, <laughs> uh, just to let you all know out there. But uh, in terms of, yeah, fantasy, I mean, uh, I used to be in more like in term, uh, uh, I used to be in more sports too. And now it's really just hockey for me now. I've uh, sort of lost interest in, well, maybe not lost interest, but in terms of the fantasy game and, and other um, sports. Yeah, it's, as you know, especially if you're in multiple fantasy hockey leagues, it's a lot of work staying on top of every single sport. And hockey, I'd say it's probably most similar to baseball and basketball, where it's definitely more of a daily grind, where fantasy football, you know, you set your lineup once a week, and you kind of set it and forget it. Hockey's definitely more of a grind. And now let's shift to your latest column about the top waiver pickups. And one, a few players caught my eye on the waiver pickups, because typically when we do them, you know, there's always players that seem like the obvious pickups, but I like your column because I feel like it goes beyond just the obvious pickups. And one player in particular I wanted to start off with was Sam Reinhart. And this is uh, also a bit of a pat on the back to yourself because he scored a hat trick last night. The day I made after. him do it. Yeah, yep, you made him do it. <laughs> the day after he wrote his column. And one of the things that you mentioned in your column has been the shift and change that you've seen in the Buffalo Sabres under Don Granado ever since they got rid of Ralph Kruger. What are some of the changes you've noticed in this team and how have they allowed Sam Reinhardt to be as successful as he's been since the change? Well, I, I want to admit also that I don't get to watch really a lot of games because I go to sleep early a lot. <laughs> so I, I, miss, I miss stuff. And plus I only have, I think, I guess, NH, or I don't have NHL TV, so I'm not able to watch a lot of games. Anyways, I just go off what, what other people are saying. And I, I've seen in interviews from Buffalo players uh, that, they are being allowed to play more f- openly uh, under uh, Granado's system. Uh, and uh, that translates to, uh, that should translate to more points. Um, so uh, yeah, that's um, from what others have said and not really my observations. I'm sorry. Sometimes, no, you know, I, I, I can't, you know, I mean, I, I go by trends a lot when I, uh, um, when I look at players for my column. Um, but I, I do look at news stories too, as well. Um, so I, I haven't a lot, I mean, I do watch some games, but some of the time, a, a lot of it sometimes is, uh, based on what other people have said. Yeah. It's hard to stay on top of every single team. You know, nobody, nobody watches every single game, right? So the important things is making sure on Twitter that you're following the right people as well. And, you know, I'm sure you're not like you don't watch any hockey, right? Like you're still watching the games and picking up on trends and hearing what's being said. That's kind of what you have to use to formulate your opinion. Work smart, not hard. That's, that's kind of how I've always been as well. So that's a a good observation. A good point though. I have noticed that the players do seem to be happier and they do seem to be playing, as you mentioned, more freely now that Don Granado is at the helm in Buffalo. And another player that caught my eye that you mentioned was Igor Sharangovich of the New Jersey Devils. He picked up an assist today, and he's been picking up his game lately as well. And I this kind of coincides with him now playing alongside Jack Hughes, and Jack Hughes looking a little bit more confident. He's got one of the best Corsi four percentages in the league. He puts the puck on net almost as much as anybody else in the league as of late. So is the Sharon Govich pickup something that uh, you've noticed a trend in his play, or is it mainly being attached to the Hughes factor and, and him being able to put so many pucks on net and, and being due for so many goals? Well, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, you can go with the Hughes um, angle on this, but I mean, Sh- Sharon Govich has enough talent in his own to, I mean, he's probably has more bad luck. Um, 
you know, he's, uh, which has maybe affected, sl slightly affected his uh, output, but, uh, and uh, Hughes had probably had, a, I mean, a lot, a lot of bad luck too, yeah. why he hasn't been producing, or he's just, you know, I, I, you know, or maybe there were other factors too, in terms of his uh, um, non-production. Yeah, because I know uh, earlier this week, just checking uh, Jack Hughes's shooting percentage, it was sitting below 10%, which for someone of his pedigree, you know, a former first overall pick, that definitely seems kind of low, right? So that was one thing where I noticed. I'm like, okay, he's putting the puck on that a lot. He is amongst the top 10 over the last 30 days. He was over the last 14 days as of yesterday, he was number two as far as shots on goal. So He's put in the puck on that a lot. Hasn't been rewarded with it. Did score today, though, against the Pittsburgh Penguins. So maybe this is something where we see Hughes erupt down the stretch. And as you mentioned, Sharon Govich, a talented player in his own right, is probably only going to capitalize and benefit from Hughes getting hot down the stretch. Yeah, and they're both on the top power play as well. Yeah, too, so. Juicy, juicy minutes on the power play. And another player that uh, you mentioned as well in your article was someone who was traded near the trade deadline. Brandon Montour went from Buffalo to the Florida Panthers. And this was a move that I was really happy to see from Montour because I don't think he's a bad defenseman. I think he's a pretty sound defensive defenseman. You wrote about him in your column. What is it about the move from Buffalo to Florida that now adds to Montour's fantasy value? Uh, the fact that he's in... Florida and not yeah. Buffalo, number one. Yeah. Number one, the second part is the uh, Air, the Ekblad, Air, Aaron Ekblad uh, um, Boyd, I guess. And what he should, well, I mean, he's not going to obviously fill it completely, but as the number two offensive defenseman behind uh, Keith Yandel, uh, he's definitely fit into it and he's getting decent power play minutes. The second, Their second power play is pretty good. Their second power play is almost as good as most of the other in the league's first power plays, uh, although, yeah, which says a lot for their first power play, I guess. But uh, yeah, he's, uh, yeah, he, uh, he produced, uh, he hasn't really produced, he's just produced, like, I think, a goal so far in the three games, I think, since he has, but he's, he's played decent minutes, decent power play minutes. So he should be somebody who gets some points. Yeah, he so far in the games he's played, he's got a goal. I'm just pulling it up here. A goal. He's a plus six. He's delivered 11 hits and five blocks in the five games he's played. So if you play in a category league, that's nice category coverage where he's giving you a little bit of everything. And like you said, there's probably a little bit of room for the offense to grow as well when it comes to mod tour. And, and then, yeah, and let's not forget he, in his first couple of years, he had over 30 points with Anaheim his first couple of years, I think, at least his first year. So he's definitely one who's had a history of scoring. Exactly. And now you put him with some uh, at least better playmakers for sure than he was dealing with in Buffalo. And as you mentioned, those two power play units in Florida are pretty lethal. So definitely not a bad spot for Brandon Montour to be in. It was probably best case scenario for his fantasy value at the trade deadline. We're going to stay with the defenseman, Eric Brandstrom. Now, this is a prospect that I've really been excited about. He was the centerpiece going back to Ottawa in that Mark Stone trade at the deadline from the Vegas Golden Knights. He's produced at the AHL level. He's produced in Sweden as well, but we haven't really seen him do it with the Ottawa Senators in the NHL. Do you think this is just a case of a 21-year-old defenseman needing a little bit of time to grow? Or do you think that maybe there's some exterior factors that might be limiting his upside right now? Um. I don't think so. I mean, this move is definitely is definitely going to help him. And I don't, I don't think, I think it was just the fact that he was, uh, they had other defensemen that they trusted more and that they traded away. I guess they traded away three of them in the, in the week two before the, uh, uh, including the deadline up to the trade deadline. So um, yeah, he's, he's, he's getting more minutes now or he's getting actual playing time. I mean, uh, first and now, and then secondary, power play time. Um, yeah, he was, that's right. Let's forget he was one of the three first round picks. Was it from their Vegas's first draft? They got Cody Glass and Nick Suzuki. That was a pretty good haul there. Yeah. Um, uh, from that first year. So, he, I mean, yeah, he has done great at the AHL level and he is someone who's quarterbacking this, their second power play. So 
uh, we'll see what he can do. But yeah, I don't think there's anything outside of that. Yeah, he needed a, a little time to grow, obviously. I mean, as a teenager, when you're drafted as a teenager, it's, you, you, need, you need time to grow. Most players are like that. Agreed. And I always find it an offensive defense, but it takes a little bit longer because part of being an offensive defenseman is jumping in on the play and taking risks and taking an ill-advised risk is the easiest way to get your butt benched. So <laughs> the, the, exactly. the Brandstrom, it's probably one of these situations where he's maybe a little bit more timid because he doesn't have the experience that he will in the coming seasons, or even as this season continues to go on and as he gets more playing time. So I like that addition as someone to potentially add in a deeper league. And especially if you play keeper or dynasty fantasy leagues, it's getting close to Brandstrom time in Ottawa, which I think is definitely a good thing. One other goalie you mentioned in your column was Devin Dubnik. And now we know Philip Grubauer is getting closer to returning from his stint on the COVID protocol list. But do you think Dubnik could still maintain a little bit of fantasy value serving as Grubauer's backup and maybe potentially someone who starts a little bit more knowing that Grubauer is obviously recovering or coming back at least from a stint on the COVID protocol list? Yeah, definitely. I mean, with that Colorado offense in front of you, it doesn't matter. He's been, I guess he's given up three goals in the two starts so far, which it wouldn't be good on some teams, but with Colorado, uh, Colorado's vaunted attack in front of you um you're gonna get wins most likely yeah it's a great spot to be in and really those numbers while they weren't great I don't know if Dubnik was fully to blame for those numbers with the Sharks because as we know it's a pretty hard position being the goaltender for the San Jose Sharks playing behind that defense not a friendly situation for very many goaltenders and With this fantasy hockey season, it's definitely been different than any other season. As we mentioned, we just talked about Philip Grubauer being placed on the COVID protocol list. There's been so many different roadblocks, obviously, more importantly for the players, right? You hope that they're safe and they recover. But also for fantasy hockey, trying to navigate everything, every injury, every uh, postponed game, suspensions are still happening. There's still a lot going on this season. So, with that in mind, what have been your biggest takeaways from this year at fantasy hockey? Um, make sure you wait to make pickups like right before games start. This is, I've had times where I've made pickups like earlier in the morning and I see later, um, oh, that player is not playing or he was sent down or he's in, now in the protocol. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I mean, if, in case, Unless it's really a star player that just happens to be on the wire or something like that, you might want to, you know, make a move in advance. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you, you got to be careful. Make sure you, you know, pay a little more attention, caution uh, when making moves. Totally. I've been burnt by that. I remember a couple of weeks ago, I added Philip Deneau when he was starting to get hot for Montreal. And I'm thinking, great. You know, he's winning face-offs. I could definitely use some help there. He's scoring goals. He's getting points. Awesome. And then that night, they announced Montreal's games for the week have been postponed. And I'm thinking, great. You know, like, there goes, especially in leagues that have a transaction cap, like in the Yahoo Friends and Family League that we're going to talk about in just a second. Ours has a four-transaction per week limit. So you can only make four ads. So when one of your four ads doesn't give you anything, you really feel the effects of that. Well, it's it feel you feel the effects of it more if you're in a weekly league that cuts off on first puck drop, um, or in the uh, other league. I'm in the Rotowire staff league. It's uh, it's cut off when the, uh, before their first game happens. So each player is locked in when their first game would happen, even if they're on protocol. So I've had ones where I've had players wiped out completely for a week and I haven't had a chance to sub them out. Yeah, it's just been a difficult time to play fantasy hockey. But in the same sense, I do feel like the managers that are more involved, obviously there's always the luck part of it. But I do feel like this year a little bit more managers that have been more involved and have been keeping up to date with everything are the ones being rewarded. And that's why I'd say you came first place in the regular season in our Yahoo Friends and Family League. I'm I'm buttering you up a little bit here, Evan, before we dive into what's actually going on. Because yep. Now we're seeing the luck part of it in our matchup. For those of you that don't know, Evan and I in the Yahoo Friends and Family League 
are going off in the semifinals of the playoffs. And Evan's team finished first in the regular season, was really dominating down the stretch. And my team was doing fine. You know, we were winning games and we were getting our wins, but we're, we were in fourth place, not in first. But a crazy turn of events, specifically between the pipes this week, has led to me leading Evan by a decently wide margin as we enter the final couple of days of our matchup. Uh, yep. Yeah, things things happen. Definitely happened. Uh, players drop out. Yeah, also uh, a couple of days ago, too, besides the goalies, uh, when both – well, Hintz is always going to be, but Haskinen also uh, just announced, oh, he's also gone for tonight, too. It's like, really? Okay, how many more guys do you want me to lose tonight <laughs> for the games? I think this yeah, was thir- – not Thursday. It was the maybe Tuesday or something like that, and I – I just looked at this, like the monitor and going, I just shook my hand going, okay, whatever, fine. It's not my week this week. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing, right? Where I say to a point, I feel like the, the better managers have been rewarded because there's only so much you can do as a manager. You, you're not in charge of some of the exterior, not motives, but the factors at hand, right, when it comes to fantasy hockey. Yeah, I don't have any uh, hotline to any of the coaches in the league oh. either, so no. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I couldn't uh, predict that one. Yeah, we'll have to maybe work on that, both of us, see if we can get uh, some, <laughs> some of these coaches. Maybe not even just to text us, but just let us, uh, let us know who's going to start that night in that. I think everybody in the yeah, I'll, uh, At the beginning of the year, or actually at the beginning of each week, I'll send them who's on my team. Yeah. And from there, and, and then uh, during the week, they'll just, uh, you know, text me. Yeah, yeah. just for the uh, for the injury report along, it'd be much appreciated. The practice reports, whatever it is, but we'll keep everyone posted on how that matchup winds up. Like I said, two days remaining. I have a pretty good lead right now, but as we know in fantasy hockey, it's not over until it's over. Yeah. So, spoiler spoiler alert: I'm playing for third place next week. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Evan, this was a blast. Thank you so much for joining the show today. It was great to talk fantasy hockey a little bit about you and a little bit about our matchup this week so it was good to you know kind of touch all the bases i appreciate you joining evan thank you very much for having me